It's been two weeks since our last, uh, since our last uh, information briefing, so a lot to catch up on over that period of time. So initially I wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on with COVID across, across the country and across the world, um, and then we'll try to hone down more locally. Um, so uh, across the U.S., um, it, I think most people have been watching watching the news and reading the paper, um, the number of cases and the number of states with increasing cases is increasing. Uh, and North Carolina has been one of those. Um, the, currently, the, the real hot spots in the areas, some of them anyway, to, to keep an eye on are Arizona, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina. For a while, North Carolina was kind of on that list, and, but we've kind of slowed down a little bit as compared to those other places. I'm not sure that means that they're doing worse or we're doing better. But, um, and, then, um, and then across some states in the Midwest. So uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the urban areas who um, were having troubles, a lot of troubles back in April and early May, um, you know, had some pretty significant um, uh, shelter in place um, that people followed and, and went through. and. Um, um, and it's just recently that they're starting to open up. In fact, today is the first day that New York is starting to have restaurants back open again. So, um, so they've been a little bit slower to open. And, um, and you know, I think they, because they got hit so hard earlier, they, um, they um, have been more cautious with that. Um, so why, why are the numbers going up? Well. Um, let's just simplify it a little bit. If you remember back in April and May, we were going to push down the curve, right? So everybody was sheltering in place, locked down, stay at home. Uh, we're not going to transmit this to each other. People really followed through, I think, for the most part, and we uh, early on, and we we were able to push down those curves. And and most of the places that did that were were very successful in pushing down their curves. Um, and then, um, and then we decided that well, you know, we'll try opening things up a little bit again. As I mentioned earlier, it's like putting the toe in the water and seeing how it goes. Um, and different states have opened up at somewhat at different rates. Um, the states that have opened up earlier and more aggressively um, are are the ones who are in a little bit more trouble now. And you know, it's not it's not rocket scientists. You don't have to have a you know, PhD in math and epidemiology to know that if you push something down and you're holding it down and then you start to let go of it, it's going to spring back up again. And, and that's what's happening. And to some extent, that's what's happening here in, in North Carolina as well. Um, so, um, you know, we have to keep an eye on that um, across the state. So um, wh what does that mean? Well, it, it means a lot of things. Um, first of all, that um, it means that travel is going to be a little bit more difficult to plan and figure out. Um, you know, I wanted to go to the beach in Florida. Should I go? Should I not go? Um, I want to visit my mom in Arizona. What does it mean that they're having all these troubles you know, compared to other places? Uh, I'm getting on an airplane. Uh, is that safe? You know, there's a lot of personal decisions that people have to make, but there are also public health implications with that. Um, the other thing it means is that um, is that uh, that there's uh, that we we as citizens and as people we we can help with this, and um, and we can help keep these places that are having resurgence in cases and numbers. And, and we can do that um, through really two, two things. Um, one is, is uh, keeping our personal distancing and being smart about what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. Avoiding large, large groups of people as best we can and, um, and, um, and wearing masks. And, and the wearing mask things, I know there's been a lot of, uh, out this week, including some things for me, um, <laughs> about the importance of wearing a mask. Now, right now, everyone's well over about 20 feet from me in here. And, and, I, and it's, wearing a mask makes the mics hard for me to pick up my voice. So, but, uh, but as long as everyone's 20 feet away, we're OK. <clears throat> but masks work. And there's been a lot of good studies that have come out, including even one today where, where mask wearing 
amongst people who um, who were in uh, involved in a uh, <clears throat> getting their hair cuts at a at a hair salon, and uh, they um, there were two people in the salon who were cutting hair who had COVID, and they were wearing masks, and the people that were in there were also wearing masks. And guess what? Out of the almost a hundred people exposed to these people, no one got COVID. It works. I mean, that's really, that's really uplifting news. I mean, uplifting news in COVID is hard to come by, but this is a good one, okay? There's other studies that show now <clears throat> a nice modeling study out of England that, that if everyone wore masks, everyone, when they were out and about, and particularly in indoor areas and where they couldn't personally distance, that the R naught would go down from 2.3 down to less than one. Okay, what is R naught? R naught is the infectivity, the number of people who get COVID from one single person. 2.3 means single person can give it, it usually gives it to 2.3 people if nothing special is being done. <clears throat> but if everyone wore masks, it would go down to less than one. <clears throat> so what is this? So what does that mean? If it's less than one, that means that transmission would be either stable or potentially even go down. This is our ticket for getting our numbers back down again and for pushing our curves back down without having to do all the pain that we did with lockdowns, shelters in places, and staying home. No one wants to go back to that. So personal distancing and wearing the mask looks like this may be our ticket to, 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 to help with this. Now there are other things that have to be done also with public health, contact tracing and, uh, and testing and, and helping people quarantine and isolate who have trouble doing that. Um, and, and those things are gonna need to be done as well. But we all can help by personally distancing, wearing a mask. Let's put the politics aside the virus knows no politics, and let's use our masks, particularly indoors, and when we can't personally distance. Where is a mask not needed? <clears throat> if you're exercising by yourself outside, you don't need a mask. Um, if you're outside and, and everyone's well spaced away from you, more than the six feet, and it's not crowded, don't really need a mask. But if you're queued up waiting to get into the big box store, you know, and there's a lot of people milling about, hanging around. Put your mask on outside there too. <clears throat> if you're um, if you're on a busy greenway, strolling, getting your exercise, and there's a lot of people whizzing by each way on the greenway with you, put your mask on then. Um, and uh, it, even though you might be outdoors, but for all means, indoors, anywhere you are, retail stores, grocery stores, drug stores, put your mask on when you go in. Um, and I, I can't say enough about that. Uh, and we can take questions afterwards if there's any specifics on mask wearing. Um, the, um, the other thing um, that I want to talk a little bit about um, regarding numbers is, you know, there are a lot of the world um, has, um, who are having troubles with COVID, particularly Europe, um, has, has gotten their numbers down through a lot of it through personal um, through um, uh, shelter in place orders and I mean they were very strict about it uh, and um, and they've relaxed their um, shelter in places lately and they're opening up their restaurants and their stores and people are getting about and going to the park schools have opened in a lot of places again their school systems on a different calendar um, and so far so good for them, but the one thing they are doing is personally distancing and, and they are more than here wearing their masks. Um, and we'll see how it goes for them. It's, we have a little bit of an advantage of being able to see how Europe's opening in this particular way um, is going to go for them, but um, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, will they also have resurgences? Probably. Um, they'll probably have clusters and outbreaks, and we'll see how well their public health can jump on these um, and, and get these back down again. Um, some countries in Europe <coughs> that, that didn't really do a lot 
of, um, of shelter in place um, have kind of regretted it, not doing it. And Sweden is a real good example. And in fact, their Minister of Health has come out and said they wish they would have done it. Uh, the, the, there have been a lot of deaths in these countries pre in Europe. Um, and the death, the death rate, which is the number of people who have died compared to the population of countries, is actually pretty high, higher than here in the U.S. Um, Belgium, for instance, Sweden, um, some of the northern European countries. Why is that? One is, is that um, it's affected their elderly populations considerably more, and, and elderly people have a higher, higher, higher death uh, rate. And they're, they're, they have more elderly people in these countries than, than we do here. Um, so um, here in the United States, our death rates continuing to decline, even in the places where our numbers are going up. And that includes here in North Carolina. Well, our numbers have gone up here in North Carolina. Our deaths have not. And, and why is that? Some of that has to do with um, who is proportionally more affected now or tend to be more younger people particularly people who are socially economically disadvantaged um, or people of uh, non-Caucasian ethnicity and they tend to be younger. Um, and um, and our, our nursing home outbreaks, while the numbers of nursing home outbreaks have increased, the number of people affected in the nursing homes actually has gone down. And, and we, we jump on these outbreaks in nursing homes faster now and test and separate and cohort and so um, there's not quite as much, uh, not quite as many people in total affected. Um, <clears throat> how are our numbers here locally? Well, here in the triad actually um, we, over the last 10 days um, our numbers have declined somewhat and um, uh, do I think this is real? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I just was on the, got before coming here, um, was uh, uh, interrogating all of my other counterparts like me through the other health systems in the area. And we haven't decreased our testing at all. In fact, testing has still gone up some uh, in, the last, uh, in the last two weeks. So um, numbers are down, but testing is up. So perhaps we're seeing less cases um, in the triad area. Our hospitalizations are also down some, modestly down, uh, and our ICU numbers are down some, modestly. So those are all good news, um, and um, and I think that um, I think we'll have to keep our eyes on those numbers um, as we are more adherent to mask wearing um, and what we can do. Um, I think that uh, some of the things that we might see that are different with local government in our areas because of our differences in numbers is um, I think w there, you're going to start seeing um, some masking um, ordinances come out um, locally. Well, this happens at the state level, I, I can't say, um, but, I, but I know it's being discussed and talked about. Some other states have done this and other municipalities have done this, including in North Carolina, including Raleigh, now has an ordinance with mandatory face wearing, mask wearing, and I support that. Um, I do support that. Um, and so we'll see what we do with that locally. Um, will we be moving to phase three? Um, I'm not the governor, <laughs> and um, um, but I, I really think that um, with the state seeing increased numbers and increased hospitalizations as a whole across the state that our phase three would probably be delayed. And if the governor asked me, I would support delaying going to a full opening of phase three. Um, and uh, would I say that we have to jump back from phase two back to phase one? No, I would not think we have to, but we're going to wear our masks, right? So we don't need to do that. Um, and. Uh, um, so I think that's what we'll see. I, I think we're going to be able to get our schools open in the fall. Um, and there has been some um, you know, recommendations on how that will look. Uh, and I know you guys have all reported on that fairly extensively, so I'm not going to go over them. But because children don't get infected as often and their infectivity is lower when they are, um, I, I don't think kids are going to be asked to wear masks um, while they're in school. Instead, they're going to be doing things by separating them, facing them all in the same direction, 
using plexiglass in certain areas rather than masking. So we'll see how that goes. I, I, uh, it, that, that recommendation could change, but that's the way it is right now. Um, some other good news um, in the COVID world. Um, this week, a study um, was reported um, out of England and, and was well, well, um, well reported on um, and about using steroids. Now, what are steroids? Steroids are things that reduce inflammation. And a lot of us have, have used steroids at one point or another. You get a bad rash from, from poison ivy, you might go on a course of steroids. If you have asthma and you have an asthma exacerbation, you go on steroids. You may be on inhaled steroids if you have chronic uh, lung disease or asthma. Um, we use steroids on our skin for rashes and things. So it's a, it's a drug we're all pro used to. Um, and while steroids do have side effects, if used in high doses for long periods of time, if used for short periods, there, there really are not a lot of downsides to them. Um, and they used uh, 10 days of steroids for people in ICUs who had COVID and for anyone who required oxygen. And the mortality um, that they reported was down a third in the ICU patients who were intubated. And I think it was around 10, 12% in people on oxygen decrease. So that means that you would have to treat only eight people to see one less death. And that, that's pretty significant in the world of medicine when therapies come out. Um, so, um, you know, we've been burned a few times by recalls of these papers and data because they haven't been peer reviewed or published. This one, I think that's less likely to happen for a lot of reasons. One of their other inflammatory lung diseases that we use steroids for that where it helps. Um, two, there's a lot of biologic plausibility, which means that it makes sense. There's a lot of inflammation in the lung and across the body with COVID. Um, and you know, that's how it affects the kidneys and the heart and the other lungs. It's through the inflammation. Um, and so if we can reduce the inflammation using steroids, uh, it would make sense that, that people would do better. Um, and, um, and so I, I think that you're going to be seeing this already started, starting to be done uh, in ICUs um, um, you know, across, across the country. In England now, it's part of their treatment protocol already. So hopefully the paper will get published soon so we can actually see the data. But they have released a protocol on how they've done it. So there are other drugs that are being coming out that are being tested, both anti-inflammatory drugs and antiviral drugs. A lot of clinical trials going on. This is a hot area right now, and so maybe even by the end of the summer, we'll have some additions to remdesivir, uh, which has some modest impact, I think, as an antiviral drug. Um, but some of the new ones out um, may, may actually be better. So we'll see. The therapy arm um, is encouraging. Um, and the vaccine arm still moving forward, and you've seen the uh, reports of that. Um, I, I know that there are some people who feel that it, they might come out before the fall, specifically before the election. I don't see that happening. Um, and. Uh, I, I would think um, by, uh, I would hope by this time next year, rather than talking about what vaccine we're going to be using, we'll be, um, we'll be actually trying to get people vaccinated. That would be my hope. Um, so um, it's moving forward. Um, with that, uh, a few questions have been posted to me, and um, the ones that I haven't. Um, talked about um, yet, um, I will try to cover now. Um, international travel, likelihood of that happening this year. Um, for some countries, yes. Um, in fact, in Europe, you know, if you want to, if you live in the Netherlands and want to visit, you know, go down for Oktoberfest in Germany, assuming it's still good, you know, I think you, it'll be, people will be able to cross borders and do that. Uh, flying internationally, there are some places that are allowing, but right now a lot of the world does not, um, is, is, is going to require a 14-day quarantine if anyone from the United States goes there. So if you want to go for a five-day vacation in London, a 14-day quarantine <laughs> doesn't make much sense um, it, unless you like hanging out in hotels while you're on your vacation. So. Um, 
Um, I, I think it's going to be hard from the U.S. And, until we can, um, until our numbers come down significantly. And I, and I don't see that in the foreseeable future. So I think international travel is going to be hard for a while. Plus, as you've probably seen, airplanes aren't feeding you and airplanes aren't giving you anything to drink. Um, and you are going to have to wear a mask on an airplane uh, when you travel. So domestic travel may be a little bit easier to do. Um, and you want to go visit your grandparents in, um, in, uh, in Iowa. Um, short flight, um, and that, that can be done. I think that's relatively safe. Um, and, and, but you will be masking, and you will be personally distancing, and you will need to bring your own bottle of water. <laughs> so, um, People are worried about the resurgence in the fall. Some are saying the second wave will be worse than the first. True? Well, true or false, I can't say. I don't. My crystal ball is not that good, but um, I'm worried about it. I know a lot of healthcare people um, are worried about it um, because that's respiratory virus season. So all respiratory viruses get worse starting in this area around November, up north a little bit earlier, um, and. Um, and that's not just influenza, but it includes all the other ones. I could give you the long list of those viruses that make us cough, sneeze, and have sore throats. They all get worse in the fall and winter. And it'll, I think it'll be the same with COVID. Why? More people are indoors, less people are outside. Uh, low humidity, cooler temperatures usually support longer times for viruses to be in the environment. Um, and Flu and COVID coming at the same time is not a good combination. Um, and um, um, so we'll have to see. Um, but, um, but I think um, a lot of healthcare systems are making sure their surge plans are ready to go in case we need them in the fall. And if we need to go back to a, a phase one or another shelter in place time, uh, that would be the time where it might be needed. Um, so we'll have to see. I, I, like I said, my crystal ball is a little rusty on that side. Maybe it won't happen, but, but we have to be ready for it. Um, what about, the, the, what about if when, when we have a COVID vaccine? Notice I'm not saying if anymore, I'm saying when. Um, how, what, will, it be, will it be like the flu vaccine? So the flu vaccine, you know, when we give flu vaccine, it, it, it helps a lot, but it's not 100%, right? We, some people get vaccinated still get the flu. Um, and obviously, we've been given flu vaccine for decades, and we still have flu hanging around. So um, will that be the case with the COVID vaccine? Well, we'll have to see. It'll depend on how good the vaccine is, how long the lasting the immunity is, and how the virus changes over time. So you know, with flu, flu is a shifty virus. So it changes its protein coat structure on the outside so that our antibodies don't recognize it as well. It kind of changes its camouflage, so to speak. And so we have to change and do a new flu vaccine every year, and that makes it a little bit harder and the vaccine a little bit less effective. But even, even when the flu vaccine doesn't prevent influenza in somebody, it does reduce the, the how bad it is. So for instance, if you got flu and if you didn't have the vaccine, you might have to go to the hospital. The vaccine would keep that from happening. Or as if you um, do get it and you go to the hospital, you're less likely to die. So um, flu vaccine does help with that. So um, presumably if the COVID vaccine is the same way, it would still help and, and could still reduce transmission enough so it'll go away. COVID doesn't seem to be as shifty as flu. And that, that's good news because um, that means that, that it's more likely that, that the shot will, be, um, will be, have a longer lasting effect than it does with flu. I think we might need two shots when the vaccine comes out. We'll have to see. One to initially boost and the other to get it up to a higher level. But we'll have to see how the clinical trials go on that. I, I'm personally kind of confident that a vaccine once implemented will, um, will reduce the numbers enough to get the R-naught, 
that transmission factor down low enough so that we won't have epidemic proportions. The virus will most likely move to be endemic, which means it'll still occur sporadically and from time to time and be part of our respiratory virus repertoire. But because a lot of people will have antibodies either through vaccination or from prior infection, they won't be as serious as in them. And so it'll be just one of our respiratory viruses we deal with. Um, that's my hope, um, and and I'm I'm reasonably optimistic with a, you know a year or two that uh, that'll be the case. So, good news is we've been in this for four months. That means only about 21 more months to go, right? <laughs> um, but we're, we are going the right way and down down the road. So, um, with that, um, I'll open it up to questions. I think herd immunity will help. Uh, the question is, will herd immunity come into reducing our numbers of infections? I think with time it'll, it'll help some, yeah. Well, I mean, without a vaccine, will it be enough? Well, you, to, get, to get herd immunity, for, you'll need a few things. One, we'll have to, we're gonna assume that there is immunity. Right now we're still working that out, right? But let's just assume there's good immunity once you've gotten the infection. Um, then um, you're going to need about six, somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of people to have gotten it. So here in the triad area, based on their antibody studies, roughly about five percent have gotten it. So we're a long ways from having herd immunity, um, and uh, so it's that would take some time and a lot of infections. I would think that a vaccine that worked well would be better than risking a big segment of our population through herd immunity. We have high school sports, um, our sports teams and schools that are starting back up practice and getting close to the fall next month. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the question is, is so we have high school sports coming back um, in the next month um, and teams coming back on high school campuses to do that. So. Um, my, my opinions on that haven't changed a lot over time. Um, so there are certain sports in, that, that are just inherently are gonna be a lot safer. Um, you know, cross country, track and field, um, non-contact sports. Um, and, and those, I mean, I, I, it, those can be done very easily without a lot of, a lot of trouble. Um, the, the sports that are going to be tough, uh, tougher are the contact sports. So, um, and, you know, so football teams training um, and then, um, um, you know, wrestling and such. The, the highest risk ones are going to be wrestling and things. And I, my recommendations if a school system would ask me on something like that would probably be to not do that. Football, football is a big deal. I enjoy high school football games <laughs> as well as anybody. Um, and, um, and, and I think there are ways to train and to bring people back to campus and do it in a safe way um, that reduce the risk of virus transmission. Um, and I think a lot of teams have thought about that. But, but they're gonna have to ch change the way they train and how you do things. Um, and contact and limiting the amount of contact between people is one of those. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I think, um, and I've said this before, I think as a society we're going to have to decide um, what, is an, what it would be, an accept, would be acceptable in a high school athlete getting COVID. You know, was one person on a team, well, that was that be that okay? Or five, is that too many? One too many? Um, those, you know, those are decisions we as a society and as a school will have to have to make because obviously um, you know, fo football, as much as we like it, is not the primary mission of the school. The primary mission of the school is to educate our children and to raise responsible adults. And if that means foregoing high school sports for a year, maybe it's worth it. But th those are decisions that are going to have to be made by our, our leaders and by us as a society. 
So I think, you know, the training and things going this summer, I think there'll be a lot of places that'll be able to pull that off, but they're going to have to be careful about how they do it. Um, and, um, and we'll see how the fall season goes. Um, um, you know, we didn't talk about it earlier, but, but large gatherings of people are, are going to be problematic. And they will be for a while. Um, and and that, that, I mean, that includes political conventions, rallies, protests. Um, large numbers of people had a football game concerts, you know, big parties, huge weddings, so on and so forth. Um, large gatherings of people are the opportunities where a super spreader or somebody who's infected can give the, give the virus to a lot of people at one time. And, um, and I, I uh, so I think that if the, the sporting events, um, in order for them to be really safe, would have to be done without large numbers of spectators. And uh, so, but you know, probably could be done. But we'll see how it goes. I, I the number of high schools and the number of school systems across the country who, who are going to be able to pull off a full football season this fall, um, I think it might be small. That would be my prediction. I think it's going to be a, training. I think that can be done. But but actually having a meaningful season like we're used to seeing. I don't know. For contact sports, I think it's going to be tough. Do you have any idea of a suggested specific training that they consider to be safe for them? Well, um, you know, it depends on the sport. And having not ever been a football player, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how all their training goes. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, it would involve, um, you know, keeping people apart. And normally we use six feet, but when you're doing full aerobic type exercises and you're moving lots of air, um, and, and if you have virus, there's going to be more virus getting out in the world. So a lot of people have actually said six feet, you know, try to spread that out even more. And then, um, and then uh, and doing it with everyone facing the same way. Try to do your training outside rather than inside. That'll help a lot. Um, and uh, but it you know it means in having the full tackle drills and or blocking drills or things like that, you might want to use other other ways to do that tackling dummies ta and things like that. I mean it, the coaches will have to modify a little bit what they do. The band, yeah. So I yes yeah, so I was in the band, so I know how the band works. Um, <laughs> So the band moves lots of the air, there's lots of people close together, and, and that's going to have to be modified too. Cheerleading, same thing, yeah. Like I said, it's, if they can pull off a season, it's not going to look like our normal ones. Have you been in uh, talks with any local uh, officials about passports to, to try out? Matt, have I been? I can neither confirm nor deny that I've been in talks with local <laughs> officials about mask ordinances. Um, and um, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, there, there are several of us in the area who advise our local government. And, uh, um, what do you make of the individuals? Uh, I don't know if you've seen the video, but the Reopen North Carolina movement, uh, one of their leaders uh, filmed herself burning uh, some masks and telling people to wear the requirement to wear a mask is an infringement on uh, your personal liberty. So I yeah so I have a yeah so the question is is that you know what a, uh, and I'll just kind of paraphrase it what about the people who are very vehemently opposed to mask wearing and say it's an infringement of our constitutional responsibilities um, well um, what would I say to those people is is that public health is a little different um, and there are other areas in public health where. Uh, we do things that um, that w some might consider interfering with people's constitutional response, you know, uh, um, constitutional rights. Uh, but we do it, and we as a society totally accept it. 
So um, if somebody who has tuberculosis refuses to isolate themselves um, and or you know, do things in a safe way. TB is a very contagious disease and it's also deadly. Um, we can actually institute quarantine orders and if the person doesn't do that, we can incarcerate them. Um, we don't do that often because we find other ways to do that. And that's accepted. Um, so and the, most, a lot of people would say, well, that interferes with the constitutional right. <laughs> but. It, it doesn't. Public health is a little different. And, and what would I say to the person is that, well, you know what, your, your personal decision might be to not wear a mask and to accept the risk. Your personal decision might be to go to a large rally or to, um, you know, a large gathering of people um, and, um, and say, well, I'm going to just accept the risk. <clears throat> but the problem is, is in public health, you accepting the risk for you means you're also accepting the risk for other people around you. So you're making decisions for your parents, for your family, for your friends, for the people you see in church, uh, for the people you may be, you know, have up uh, standing in line with at the grocery store. Uh, because if you get COVID, you're endangering these other people too. You're infringing on their right to be healthy. And, um, and, and so it's different. You know, if you choose to bungee jump, jump and accept the risk, you know, fine. <laughs> but, but, but for you to personally accept the risk, that, that means something to other people. And, you know, and for elderly people and people with underlying diseases, we're not talking about five days of, of you know, of illness and 85% of people doing great. You know, we're talking about some, you know, and, and real older people and such, we're talking about 15 to 20 percent of people maybe dying. And um, so I, I think it's irresponsible and I think it's, um, I think it's, um, frankly, I think it's, it's, it's not polite, it's rude um, to be endangering other people because you feel your constitutional right is more important. Going off of that, um, in the great wide world of Facebook, people are presenting and find whatever facts work for them when it comes to masks. Masks say, do more harm than good, or I only wear it in this place, or I wear it in this place. You are one of the few people on this earth who are actually educated on it. <laughs> so what do you say to people who always can find something that supports their individual view? Well, yeah, you can always find something that supports your individual view. I suppose you could actually write something <laughs> that's your individual role and put it on Facebook. Bask work, um, and there, there, the, the aspect that there's more harm than good from a mask is just not true. I, you know, for some people, for some people, there are some people who can't wear a mask because of either an underlying medical condition or, you know, severe claustrophobia or things like that. Um, that is true, but. But otherwise, um, it's just not true that they're going to do more harm than good. And again, a mask protects the people around you it's to, rather than to protect you. Because if you are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, or even if you're symptomatic and decide for some reason to go out and about, which you shouldn't, um, the mask keeps your viruses here rather than out, out in the world. And um, that's... Um, so that's, that's just, I mean, that's just it. They're wrong. <laughs> they they, they, they work. Couple, it's now been a couple of weeks since uh, protests have begun here in the Triad. So I wanted to see if you had any update on uh, numbers of COVID patients related to protests. Yeah, the number of, of COVID patients related to protests. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, but... Um, I don't, I don't think we've had, I, I don't see any large outbreaks or um, clusters um, related to protests yet. Um, you know, we'll have to see as time goes on. But, I, you know, a, any large gathering has that risk. You know, some things about protests make it a little better. And if people are wearing masks, for instance, they're outside, um, that helps a lot. Um, but. We'll have to see. I, I, I don't, in our area, I have not seen evidence that there's been anything that's directly been linked to protests. 
in our area here, a lot of our cases are still household related, um, nursing home related, workplace related. And, and on that, and, and by the time this out, out, epidemic is over, 21 months from now or whatever, um, I mean, every workplace will have been affected by this at some point or another. And um, so, um, but that, that's where a lot of our cases still are here. There is some community transmission where people say, well, I don't know where I got it. Yeah, that's happening. But, um, but in our area, it's still, um, it's certain social economic groups, particularly Hispanic populations, um, and, uh, and certain zip codes seem to be seen more than others. So, hang on a second while I turn this off. Is there anything new with demographics of locations and geography that's new? Not so much. No, our, our, our demographics and, and, um, and geography has not changed a lot. Um, there, may, there may have been some. I think there's probably been actually less, less infections in our Hispanic populations, um, but we'll have to we'll have to see. I mean, we're in the next month. There's going to be more testing done in our social economically depressed areas and in certain ethnic groups. So um, we'll have to see what what that information gives us. I, you know, I think, would I advocate for a mask ordinance? So I think one thing that a mask ordinance does um, is, um, um, is, it, is it gives um, businesses, retail stores and things, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, of leeway to put a sign on their door that says masking is, uh, you know, please, please face mask to enter or you know, face masking is, is highly encouraged, or you know, a business can actually require it for entry. Um, and, a, and an ordinance helps those places do that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I, you know I, I would rather you know, just have people do it rather than have to have a law. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you know your high school kid should just do his homework. You shouldn't have to, to tell him to do it and make a rule in the house that your homework has to be done. If everyone did their homework, you, you wouldn't need the rules, right? So, uh, <coughs> you know, personal responsibility, I think. If, if it's there, then, then we don't need the ordinances. But, but, I mean, a lot of other cities are starting to do it now. So, if everyone puts it together, then... Uh, you are I, I would I would be support of a of an ordinance yeah that that would personally I would be in support. Um, what, do you, what do you make of uh, some fitness center and gyms have uh, found a loophole to reopen compared to uh, people that I guess need a like uh, I'm not sure what we're talking about like a medical exemption for people that need to exercise um, and the states. Uh, Yeah, so the, yeah, the question is, is what about some of the fitness centers and gyms that have, quote, found loopholes in order to reopen? So um, <clears throat> this is the theme that we're going to see because <laughs> um, I think, um, um, you know, right now, supposed, you know, technically under phase two, bars aren't supposed to be open, but a lot of places have kind of found loopholes to do that. So, the, so for these places, the devil's in the details. Um, and, and how that it's done. So there are certain gymnasiums that the sport itself is inherently not as, as high risk. For instance, um, um, swimming, um, gymnastics, um, um, you know, um, martial arts without contact, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and and those, those, I think, it's safe. Um, but it's that's different than a that's different than a fitness center that has you know a, a small enclosed area indoors, and there's um, thirty you know c 
cardiovascular aerobic machines and, and people um, getting their pulses and heart rates up to 140, 160 and their respiratory rates up to 40, anyone who has virus is going to shed it in, into the environment in that situation. Um, and because it's indoors, uh, it doesn't disperse as well, the machines keep it up in the air, those are going to be higher risk. Um, they just are. And, you know, fighting the law is not going to make it lower risk. Um, and, um, you know, at least right now it's summertime and outdoor exercises um, is so much safer. You're welcome.